why is this arc called the Red Butler arc on the fan wiki? I thought we all just called it the Jack the Ripper arc. Hello, and welcome back to my Black Butler Deep Dive, a series of videos in which I take far too much time recapping and analyzing each Black Butler story arc, going chapter by chapter, at least for now. That being said, let's dive into the story arc that got many of us morbidly fascinated with the real life serial killer Jack the Ripper. The Red Butler arc starts off simple. We follow Sebastian and Ciel to their townhouse in London, where we find out that Madame Red, her new butler Grell, and Lau were already there making themselves at home. It's nearing the end of summer, aka the social season, a time in which aristocrats and like the one percenters flock to London and host parties. You know, being social. However, there's been a very suspicious and gruesome murder that's got the Queen concerned. Which is why CL, our anti-social king, has made the trek to London during this busy social period. And it's up to CL to get to the bottom of this new problem and to prevent it from happening again. Or at least from becoming like a long-term ongoing problem. This is where we're introduced to what has become the main story element in Black Butler, an air of mystery. But not a classic traditional mystery story, where you get presented with all the evidence and can deduce what's going on. More a mystery that the characters are in, and we as the audience aren't really made privy to the actual investigation, nor the clues that help solve the case. As frustrating as that sounds, Black Butler plays the dynamic very well. This investigation isn't important to the story here. Like, it's not... It's not the important part. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the puzzle piece that we need, basically. The only thing that matters is the results, and what the characters do or learn with said results. Also, you can argue that a lot of the times the reader learns things as CL learns them, so it makes sense considering that Sebastian is actually the one doing all the investigating, which, sure. But up until this arc, Sebastian has been the sole main character, and CL isn't quite the main character just yet. After discussing matters with Madame Red and Lau, the group head off to meet Undertaker, a strange, strange man who can be bought with a good joke instead of money, which, fair. This is when we learn that this Jack the Ripper fellow has killed quite a few times before, and Undertaker was able to group these victims together based on the common fact that these victims were all prostitutes whose uteruses had been removed. Which, as far as I could tell, was a thing that the real life Jack the Ripper had done, on occasion at least, and many of the victims within the Black Butler series are based on real life victims, down to the names being the same. With the new information that this was a string of serial murders and the fact that their uteruses had been removed, Ciel and the gang make the assumption that whoever the killer was had to be someone who was educated in medicine and anatomy, and possibly someone who had connections to the dark underworld or creepy cults. During the carriage ride home, Sebastian promises to compile a list of all people in London who could possibly fall into that category and investigate them, which, you know, he does flawlessly and inhumanly fast because why not? Much to Madame Red's surprise, Sebastian beats them home with a full list of people, their alibis confirmed, and the suspect list narrowed down to just one person. See what I mean now when I say that Black Butler is a mystery only in the loose sense of what the genre usually has to offer. At least for the individual story arcs. We have plenty to speculate about when it comes to the overarching plot and the mysteries of character motivations, especially in more recent storylines, but we'll get there in due time. I do, however, understand the decision to present the story in this way, at least the Jack the Ripper arc. Having Sebastian go off behind the scenes and coming back with mere moments later with everything done is kind of funny, and seeing his actual process would take away from the mystery and whimsy that surrounds his character and the bit that he's just really good at everything. So it creates this unknowing air 
that really works for his character and the tone of Black Butler. It's, it's all in good fun, basically. <laughs> The setup for the Red Butler arc is crucial because it goes to further establish the tone of the series as a whole and introduces us to very important characters like Undertaker and Grell, although at the start she is just a butler, but I think Sebastian knows there is more to this not so great butler than meets the eye because when they first meet, he gives her a knowing glance, at least that's how I interpret it. Maybe it's a suspicious glance? I'm not entirely sure how good Sebastian is at seeing a person and knowing they're not human or knowing what they are. It doesn't come up super often, but it comes up when convenient, and he does mention later that he did know from the start that Grell was not as she seemed. Who knows? It does seem that other creatures, such as Reapers, are better at sensing demons or abnormal abnormalities than demons are but to be fair i am referencing parts of the story that i don't clearly remember at the time of writing and recording this video it's i've been sitting with black butler for far too long everything gets jumbled up in here that's why i'm having to reread every chapter as i make these deep dives so everything is fresh in the noggin also can i just point out this is the exact moment Grell fell in love. Now that Sebastian has things narrowed down to just one possible suspect, it's time for us to be introduced to the worst reoccurring character in the entire series, Viscount of Druitt, or known as Alistair Chamber. A nasty, nasty man. And I'm not, I'm not even sorry to anyone who likes this character. His sole purpose is to be that comedic gag character that makes the readers uncomfortable at the same time. And I hate him. Okay, mini rant over. He's not really a gag character in this first bit, but when he shows back up again later, he kind of he kind of is, or at least he's treated that way in the anime and like kind of in the musicals. It's He's one of those characters that gets propped up to be a bad guy, but then he's never actually taken seriously. So in my brain, that classifies him as a gag character just a bit. Now the rant is over. <laughs> Viscount Druid is the man to be investigated. And oh look, how convenient. He just so happens to be hosting a party that very evening. So the gang decides to infiltrate the party. And yes, we start to get snippets of fan service. Our young, manly male child, <laughs> CL, has to go undercover, cross-dressing as a girl. Wow, how scandalous. I would like to remind y'all that Black Butler is published in a shonen magazine, so despite most of the English-speaking fan base being women, as far as I can tell, I do not speak Japanese. I don't know what the Japanese fan base looks like, but I would assume it is also predominantly women. So despite the fandom being predominantly women, this series is, at least on some level, targeted towards teen boys. A bit. I have seen some people say that even though uh, Black Butler and a few other manga series are published in shonen magazines, the target demographic is actually women. However, I don't, I don't know. If that were the case, why aren't they being published in shoujo or jose magazines? I have no clue. But the fact that it is published in a shonen magazine tells me that someone is expecting teen boys to read this and be drawn to whatever is going on in this manga. So please don't forget, please don't forget this as we discuss some of the other scenes that pop up later. Like these scenes were written with the intention of, um, or at least the thought of, somebody's gonna think this is for teen boys. All right. <laughs> I also want to point out that Madame Red explicitly states that the Viscount of Druid loves women of all ages. And, um, ma'am, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? After a few moments of Ciel experiencing gender dysphoria and Madame Red being horny on Bane, we get some classic comedy. You know, that thing where someone says something that they really don't want to happen and then said thing almost immediately happens. 
Lady Elizabeth is such a wonderful girl. A very women supporting women type of girl. Which is all fine and good, except she also wants to compliment CL. As she's been complimenting every other cute woman in this party. <laughs> Ciel is desperately trying to avoid her, while also trying to get an in with the Viscount, which ends up being easier than anticipated. Viscount Durant was so enamored by Ciel and Sebastian's dancing that he decided to approach Ciel first. Let's just lay some things out on the table first. Ciel is still 12 years old, and I think he looks like it too. Viscount of Druitt is a grown-ass man, and despite the popular misconception, it was not normal for grown men to be interested in children and young teens. Adults did not marry children, typically, and the idea that women got married as young teenagers during this time just isn't true, generally speaking. So now that we're all on the same page, Viscount of Druitt compliments CL and gets way too close and handsy. First of all, they literally just met. Second of all, that's a child, my guy. <laughs> and he's got to know that. I believe that this gross behavior of his here is used as narrative shorthand to show us that he is not a good guy. We see this all the time in media in general. Like, for example, in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Araki will often have his bad guys mistreating dogs, usually killing them. It's kind of become a meme that no dog is safe in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. But Araki does this because that's something that he sees as downright evil. He loves dogs, so in his mind, anyone who would harm a dog has got to be the scum of the earth. So, when an author or mangaka wants us to immediately see a character as horrible and evil, they will often show the readers through little behaviors that are universally seen as disgusting and downright awful and evil that don't require much context. So, animal abuse, pedophilia, those don't require a lot of context to understand as a bad action. <laughs> Whereas something like manipulation or abuse might consider, consider, might need a little bit of context for the reader to fully understand. So that's what I think is going on here. Just a little bit of shorthand for us to see that, hey, Viscount of Druid's a little bit of a predator. Um, not a good guy. Definitely not a good guy. Ciel is rightfully upset and uncomfortable with all this, seen by the way that he wipes his hand after the Viscount kisses it, or the way that he vows to put that bastard in the ground himself. Lizzie is also still trying to compliment Ciel, so he's under a lot of stress. The Viscount is suspiciously inviting Ciel to do something, and Lizzie is also approaching. So, like, this is it. This is how Ciel dies. He has got to get in there. He's rushing the Viscount. So yeah, he is kind of playing into like the flirting it up, but it is kind of what he has to do. And it's so weird. The Viscount is um, falling for it. But we see in a minute that he has ulterior motives. But how is Ciel gonna get away from Lizzie? Sebastian does magic tricks which distracts Lizzie, allowing for Ciel to finally make some progress in his investigation, which means disappearing behind a hidden door with the Viscount while Sebastian does a little bit of magic. And, oh, Ciel has found himself in a predicament, one that smells like being drugged by a very strange and creepy man. This next chapter takes a step back from the cliffhanger of the last as we become subjected to the worst kind of fan service in this series and the types of thing that Black Butler has become known for in the greater anime community. The corset scene? <laughs> the fact that this scene was written for teen boys and not freaky Fujoshi girlies? Miss Yana Tabuso was wildin'. I don't care who you are, what you ship, 
and what you think about this scene. It was weird to include. It's almost Sebastiel Fujo bait in a way, kind of. It unnecessarily sexualizes Ciel, something that happens again and again in the manga, but more so in official artwork. And yeah, it's a haha funny that makes you think something naughty is going on, only to reveal that it's just a silly misunderstanding on your part. But it's inappropriate, and it kind of... The first page, it frames it like Ciel is having sex. It frames it that way. It's not me misunderstanding. It is me being led to believe that's what's going on before we get... the Before, before it's revealed, before the... What am I trying to say? It's a metaphor. Before the tablecloth gets yanked out from under you. I don't know. The floor gets ripped from under you. Um, it's inappropriate. I would argue that it also doesn't match the tone of this series so far, but earlier chapter cover art has weird sexual tones to it. I don't care what you have to say about it. If CL is drawn doing something that I, as a 25-year-old grown person, would do to feel like the hottest, sexiest person in the room, then maybe a 12-year-old shouldn't be drawn in that context. It doesn't really sit well with me. It never really has, and it's only recently that I've fully figured out why it feels so off and strange. Sorry, but if I'm going to engage with Black Butler, I need to rant about this when it's relevant. Also, wild that this 12-year-old boy is being sexualized for other teen boys. However, I do recognize that despite the intended demographics, Black Butler has a strong female audience, and maybe it was that way from the start, or maybe Yana intended to write a manga that could appeal to all demographics in a way. And I imagine that does influence the type of fan service that gets included, but it's still weird and nasty. We then shift from fan service to the revelation that Ciel has been captured and tied up, and the Viscount is auctioning him off to a bunch of weirdos. However, Ciel is unfazed, which honestly does feel a bit out of character for him, but at this time I'm thinking of characterization that hasn't quite happened yet in the manga. But to be fair, Ciel is kind of unfazed because he knows that Sebastian is just a call away. And then we get a better understanding of how their contract works, and the fact that they have a powerful contract due to the mark being placed in Ciel's eye. The more obvious the mark, the more power the contract holds. We also get confirmation that Ciel is tied to Sebastian forever, and Sebastian promises to take him to the deepest pits of hell. Because that's a comforting thought. Anyway, they have to rush out of there because the yard, aka the police, were on their way. And that's case closed. Objection! Jack the Ripper has struck again. Ciel has realized that they were either wrong about the Viscount, or there were more players involved. We also see at the start of the chess symbolism that becomes a staple of the series, especially the anime, specifically like seasons one and two. We also get to see Madame Red be a bit vulnerable and real with Ciel. She, rightfully so, laments about how Ciel has become a member of the underworld, working as the queen's watchdog. However, she hits the nail right on the head when she speculates that the main reason Ciel is taking up this role is so that he can avenge the death of his parents, to which Ciel denies, stating that revenge won't change anything and is just a selfish waste. And honestly, there is a lot to unpack here. If I may use future knowledge, those who have read at least through the Emerald Witch arc know that Ciel struggles with survivor's guilt. He views himself as a selfish person for having been the sole survivor and doing what it takes to survive afterwards. And we do know that a part of the terms of his contract with Sebastian is avenging his family's deaths, essentially. He can seek revenge but also feel that it's a selfish waste, that won't change anything. He's a bit self-aware and also incredibly self-deprecating. Madame Red continues to reminisce on Ciel's childhood, even mentioning when he was born. We also learned that Madame Red was a nurse who couldn't have children of her own. She confesses that she sees Ciel as her own son, which isn't too far-fetched for an aunt or uncle to feel, 
for their nieces or nephews, especially if said aunt or uncle was very present throughout the child's life. Madame Red pleads with Ciel to abandon his role in the underworld, however, he insists that he's made his choice. And that's the end of the conversation. Madame Red is genuinely worried for her nephew, even going as far as entrusting Sebastian to be there for Ciel when she can't. Afterwards, Ciel and Sebastian continue to discuss the investigation. The math isn't mathing. By all means, the Viscount should have been the culprit, but he clearly wasn't. Sebastian has a moment of implying he knows something, making Ciel decide if he wants to act on what Sebastian knows. You know, I wrote a little bit here before I finished reading this story arc about how I've known this story for 12 years and the twist of this arc, so I genu genuinely couldn't tell the first what a first-time reader was supposed to infer from this conversation. Um... Is it implying that Jack the Ripper isn't human? Probably. It definitely is. <laughs> like, the next couple of chapters solidify that. Maybe I should finish reading story arc before I start writing my script for these things, but, you know, it is what it is. We've also gotten a couple other hints as to who or what could be Jack the Ripper. More so who than what, but... If there's one thing that I can admire about Sebastian's character, it's his commitment to the bit, even down to playing along with CL's themed monologues. It's it's like a cool thing, but like kind of in the way that a parent or adult family member would play along with the child. Like, I have a nephew who really likes Paw Patrol, and so he gets to talking about Paw Patrol, and I play along, much in the same way that Sebastian is playing along here with the chess symbolism. I think I've been spending too much time uh, re-entering the fandom space, specifically on Tumblr. A lot of the people I follow now that are Black Butler fans on Tumblr are very into Dad Bastion, where they really play up the parent-child dynamic of Ciel and Sebastian, and it's so fun. We're just- everyone's having a great time. <laughs> Why couldn't we do this in 2015? Why couldn't the fandom be like this the whole time? Ciel and Sebastian go undercover again to find Jack the Ripper, this time posing as common folk in the East End, standing by where Sebastian is certain the killer will strike again. We then get a bit of flashback clarifying that, yes, Sebastian is implying that the killer isn't human. We also get a bit of Sebastian being a technicality bitch <laughs> and CL getting frustrated with him, which is iconic, and I kind of love their spiteful dynamic. Oh, somehow our suspects slipped right past them. I also love that despite everything, Sebastian goes out of his way to keep CL from witnessing the horrors, but he'd seen enough to have some kind of reaction. It doesn't happen often, but it becomes established that when Ciel is under a lot of stress and suffers something like a panic attack, he throws up. I'm not sure if that's what's supposed to be going on right here, but I do want to point it out for the sake of building a profile of our little Earl here. And surprise, surprise! Our killer is the butler Grell! And there's more to this person than meets the eye. She is an icon. And yes, if you haven't gathered already, I subscribe to the Trans Grell Truth. I don't care that the other characters in this series refer to her as a man. Well, I do care in the sense that I think they're being transphobic, but neither here nor there. Grell refers to herself as a woman, and that's enough for me. There's also the fact that Yana Teboso herself, the creator of Grell, has stated that Grell is in fact a trans woman. Not sure if anyone here will take issue with that, but also, if you're transphobic, what are you even doing here? <laughs> like, honestly. Anyway, Sebastian and Grell were both shocked to encounter each other. More so the fact that Grell was shocked to encounter a demon, and Sebastian was shocked to have encountered a Grim Reaper their first times. And we get the reveal- I kind of spoiled this. We get the reveal that Grell is a Grim Reaper, and supposedly a neutral force. 
That's what she's supposed to be, but that's not what she's being. Her lack of neutrality is all due to her admiration and love for Madame Red. Yes, that's right. Ciel's aunt is part of this as well. What a surprise. It's also revealed that each of the victims had had abortions at the hospital where Madame Red worked. Now that everything's out in the open, Madame Red will not surrender. And it's now time for everyone to roll initiative. Yeah, if you couldn't tell by now, I'm one of those people. However, not without a bit of banter between Grell and Sebastian. Grell is a typical fangirl when it comes to Sebastian. She's majorly in love with the idea of him. However, he is disgusted by her. Be it her poor work as a butler, her flamboyant aesthetics, or another less savory option. I'm not saying Sebastian is transphobic, but... Sial then gives the orders to Sebastian to hunt his aunt and her so-called butler. Things are getting a little heated. This next chapter opens on a flashback of Madame Red. She's always hated her red hair and the color red in general. However, that all changed when she got a compliment from a man. Back to the present! It's now time for the action! Now, I'll be honest, the action scenes in Black Butler usually serve as a testament to how strong Sebastian is and also how strong Grim Reapers can be. However, there are some things from this battle worth mentioning. First off, when Sebastian gets hit by Grell Scythe, we see his cinematic record. For all intents and purposes, the cinematic record is a person's memories, an interpretation of your life flashing before your eyes when you die or have a near-death experience. It's also a tool that the Grim Reapers use to judge humans where, who are scheduled to die. It's kind of like a, a concept that the Grim Reapers will look through your cinematic record and decide if it's time for you to die or if you should be allowed to keep living. However, we don't really see Reapers decide that a human can keep living, so I'm not really sure what it would take, what they would have to see. But it is a concept that this series throws out there as a possibility. However, if you are deemed ready to die, or it's your time, you don't deserve to live any longer, a Grim Reaper will sever your cinematic record. And that's the end. The end of it. Basically, the cinematic records are just strips of film. And I think conceptually, after your last memory, it would be empty film, but they cut it there. So that's where your the movie of your life ends. This is an important concept for later on in the story. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have rambled about the workings of film and the records. Anyway. While Sebastian and Grell are engaged in battle, Madame Red and Ciel have a confrontation of their own. Ciel really just wants to understand where his aunt is coming from, but she is certain that he won't get it. She even stoops as low as yelling that she wished he had never been born, which seems to really upset Ciel for reasons and insecurities we aren't quite privy to yet. Oh, and the icing on this depressing cake? Madame Red also attempts to murder Ciel, causing Sebastian to rush over to stop her. However, Ciel doesn't want Sebastian to kill her, and we see that Madame Red is all bark and no bite when it comes to Ciel. Which, yeah, <laughs> that's her family, and she does genuinely care for him. However, Grell grows dissatisfied with this display of humanity, and ends Madame Red herself, exposing her cinematic records, providing motivation to Madame Red's killing spree. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I'm not really sure here if Ciel and Sebastian can see the cinematic records, or if it's just something Grell can see, and it's a fun way to go into flashbacks for the reader. Madame Red, or Angelina, was Rachel's younger sister, and 
she adored her sister. Angelina was pretty insecure about her looks, but was aiming to be a doctor when she grew up. However, her insecurities began to melt away after meeting and falling in love with Vincent Phantomhive. Much to her dismay, Vincent fell in love with Rachel instead, and they got married, and later gave birth to Ciel. Angelina spent a lot of time around the new Phantom High family, trying her best to manage her jealousy and just enjoying spending time around the people she loved most, even if they didn't love her in the same way. Well, except for Rachel. I'm pretty sure Rachel loved her in the same way, because, you know, they're siblings. Angelina found herself going to parties more often despite previously not enjoying them. They weren't really her cup of tea. But now she goes to parties all the time, and she's a hoot. And she ends up meeting a man who she marries. He was nice and understanding of the fact that Angelina was in love with someone else who was essentially out of reach. But she was happy enough. And her and her husband ended up getting pregnant. But before she could give birth, they were hit by a runaway carriage, killing her husband and injuring her to the point of needing her uterus removed and losing the child. Rachel tried her best to cheer Angelina up, inviting her to celebrate her recovery once she was led out of the hospital. However, the day that was planned to celebrate was also Ciel's 10th birthday, and the Phantom Hive Manor went up in flames that day painting the sky in red, a color that Angelina hated, then grew to love, but now resents once again. This woman truly can't catch a break. Now that Angelina has lost everything, her only solace in life is being able to work, something that keeps her busy and distracted from her misery. However, she couldn't run from her problems when her patients were throwing away the things that she so desperately wanted. Women coming in for abortions when Angelina couldn't have children despite how badly she wanted it. Her jealousy festered, and she took that resentment and killed with it. Her anger driving her to tear these women apart, hating them for taking their fertility for granted. Angelina's killing spree put her on the path to meet Grell, who understood. While Angelina's rage isn't fueled by gender dysphoria, there's still jealousy there. Still resentment due to what she can't have no matter how badly she wants it. And shortly after their chance meeting, Ciel comes back with a mysterious butler? However, Angelina's jealousy has grown to taint every aspect of her life. Ciel isn't her sister, or Vincent, the man that she loved. Sure, she loved her nephew and was happy to see him, but he's not who she truly desired. And so she promises not to yield, not anymore. And her life comes to an end, covered in red. Grell laments on how Madame Red gave into silly emotions and how she had broken the rules for her. Grell takes Madame Red's coat, which becomes a staple in her design, from this moment forward. Ciel, having just witnessed the gruesome death of his aunt, reminds Sebastian that his orders were to hunt down Jack the Ripper, which includes Grell, who is still, you know, available to be hunted. Their fight is pretty action-packed. Sebastian has finally found an opponent that he has to try against, one that could very well kill him. However, his loyalty to Ciel and their contract fills him with the confidence he needs to win. He must win the fight. That's what was expected of him. And here we have further establishment of just how far Sebastian has to go to protect Ciel and just how deep this contract binds. Sebastian is contractually obligated to protect and help Ciel, even when potentially facing his own demise. The two continue to battle as Grell gushes about how much she has grown to like him, despite her knowing Sebastian will never like her in the same way, or at all even. Much to Sebastian's dismay, she compares their relationship to the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet, 
since a demon and a reaper are naturally at odds. I also really love the tidbit here about how Sebastian is incapable of love. His eyes are tarnished, as Grell puts it. Due to his devilish nature, his relationships with others have, does, and will lack love. The only purpose here is defilement. And just as it seems that the fight is reaching its climax, Grell slices Sebastian open. Sebastian, just having been sliced open by a reaper's death scythe, now has a cinematic record out on display. A recap of his daily life as a butler, and I really do mean a recap. The snippets we see are literally just things that happened in the previous initial story arc, and it's lacking in the drama and insight that Grell was expecting, leaving her utterly disappointed. This moment does give Sebastian time to get back on his feet and recompose himself, and he decides to finally use a method that he had been avoiding. This revelation causes Grell to assume, like us, that Sebastian is going to take this fight seriously and maybe even use more of his demonic power, maybe even get a little bit of a taste of demon form. Not sure what to expect, but we're all expecting some fun demon shenanigans, right? Wrong. Sebastian goes for a more logistical approach, jamming Grell's scythe with his tailcoat. And this seems to work, turning the battle in Sebastian's favor, going from an actual battle to just beating Grell up. But just as Sebastian goes in to deliver that final fatal blow using Grell's scythe, he's intercepted. William T. Spears, a stoic reaper who is also Grell's supervisor and a fan favorite. I don't know, I didn't realize I liked this character until now. I'm like hyping him up. He's fun. Also, yeah, in Black Butler, the Grim Reaper world reeks of corporate bull. William apologizes, but we can tell by the way he talks to Sebastian, literally calling him a noxious beast, that reapers really do not like demons in general, which I get it. When your sole job is to collect human souls and a demon is going around eating souls, complicates things. Sebastian takes it in strides though. He subtly compares Madame Red's situation with that of someone like Ciel. So overcome with despair and misery that they'll do anything to get out of it. Even digging themselves into a deeper hole if that's what they think will help. The light at the end of the tunnel, no matter how faint or fake, will always tempt a human. And like, yeah, Madame Red is drawn to Grell. Grell seems like the light at the end of the tunnel, someone who could help her feel better. Ciel makes a contract with Sebastian at his lowest moment, hoping that Sebastian can help him feel better. It, it is the same. It's the same, but it's different, but it's the same. After things wrap up with the Reapers, we return to Ciel, who has just gone through a lot. Not only did he learn that his aunt was a serial killer, but she also attempted to kill him and poked at one of his greatest insecurities. And that was brutally murdered right in front of him. It's a lot to process and he's doing his best, I guess. But now it's time for him and Sebastian to return home to the townhouse. Our next chapter actually opens with a group of children wondering why so many people are at the church that's nearby. And then the undertaker kind of shows up to answer their questions. It's a noblewoman's gala, the last grandest ceremony of her life, Angelina's funeral. Ciel makes a big display that parallels his father's first compliment to her bringing a red dress up to her casket, claiming that that's what suits her best, not the white flowers that decorate her funeral or the plain clothes that she's being buried in, but the color of licorice that blazes the earth, which just so happens to be the title of this stage musical that adapts the story arc. Fun fact. Sebastian then releases red rose petals or on high school host club style. We then fast forward to the burial or after the burial, Lao is 
curious as to if CL will tell the Queen the true identity of Jack the Ripper, basically ratting on his family. However, CL states that there is no need to since the problem has been handled. Lau then talks about how he should be careful not to fall on the Queen and CL's bad side. However, CL mentions that opium is starting to be a problem and it's only a matter of time before he'll have to shut down Lau's operation. Lau honestly takes it like a champ, stating he'll just find another business. Ciel and Sebastian then visit the grave of the woman whose murder they tried to prevent, and we learn that Ciel is the one who paid for and organized her grave. Honestly, I think this moment is used to humanize Ciel. Up until this point, he's mostly been hyped up as a cruel and ruthless kid who's making a name for himself in the adult world. But there's more to him than meets the eye. He's full of guilt and feels a sense of responsibility for the bad things that happen around him, stating that he could have saved her life if he tried, but he didn't consider her life when they were in the thick of it. His main priority was just capturing Jack the Ripper. Ciel and Undertaker talk about his position being collared by his family duties to the Queen, and Undertaker gives Ciel a warning not to lose himself or his life to this duty. It's unclear why, but Undertaker is invested to some degree in Ciel's survival even inviting him to visit any time. Another moment that I find worth talking about is when Sebastian calls Ciel kind. It's a fact that Ciel has gone out of his way to do something nice. He didn't have to arrange for Mary Kelly's burial, but he did. There's a shred of niceness and humanity in him, but Ciel's adamant that he is not deserving of such a compliment. He insists that he is not kind. Now, there's not much to work with yet in the manga for analyzing his character, and when I say yet, I mean as far as we've covered in this deep dive. But I think this does show a lot of what CL is struggling with. He has suffered through something that makes him incapable of thinking of himself in a positive light. Sebastian then suggests that he calls CL a coward. Another thing that upsets him. Another insecurity of his, perhaps? Sebastian wonders why Ciel didn't shoot Madame Red when she attempted to attack him. He pokes and prods at Ciel, asking if he had hesitated because he couldn't do it. He could willingly make decisions that resulted in a stranger's death, but he could not pull out his gun and cause the death of someone he cared for. However, Ciel flips this on its head and brings up their contract, laying out on the table for the readers that Sebastian has to keep Ciel alive until he reaches his goals, and Sebastian can consume his soul. Ciel then follows up with the fact that he knew she wouldn't be able to actually go through with killing him, and that he also needed to keep her alive to be properly judged and, you know, for the yard to save a little bit of face. We then get more chess symbolism. However, I urge you to take what Ciel is saying with a grain of salt. He claims that he will not hesitate to do what is necessary for his goals, even if that means collecting a pile of corpses under his throne. He'll continue to manipulate his pawns until the end. Ciel is 12 years old, mind you. He's clearly gone through something and is now talking big. I see this as less of a testament of how cruel he can be, and more of him trying to affirm to himself that that's just how things are, and he needs to be that cruel to survive. Which in a sense is true, and that's also the version of Ciel that Sebastian is cultivating. Ciel then gives Sebastian an order to always stay by his side, which is honestly a bit redundant but further shows how insecure and afraid he really is deep down. He needs affirmations that those closest to him will remain by his side, even when he knows that they're already bound by a contract. Sebastian humors him though. The demon will always remain by Ciel's side, waiting for instruction.
With this being the first main story arc in the series, it has a lot to set up and reinforce. After spending the first five chapters of the manga, setting up Sebastian as the most perfect being to exist, it was rather refreshing to see him struggle in a fight. Even if he did win said fight in the end, it wasn't without effort. The Red Butler arc sees our main characters struggle in a way that makes them feel very human. I know it's ironic because Sebastian's not a human, but struggle is something that is very human regardless of the aspect of humanity of your characters. Does that make sense? I went off script there, so I'm sorry if that didn't make sense. <laughs> While we may not know much about what CL's deal is just yet, we can infer a lot of how he feels by the way he thinks and his actions thus far. CL cares deeply about those he loves, but he also feels the need to put up a cold, uncaring front in order to survive. I also think he puts up walls between him and Sebastian to protect himself. Sebastian saw him at his worst, and is committing to keeping Ciel in this pit of misery in order to flavor his soul. And while Ciel may hold a lot of power, I don't think he feels that he deserves it, and still feels powerless. So he wants to appear stronger to those he is supposed to have power over, and that includes Sebastian. It's also just embarrassing to be known and vulnerable, especially to a demon who doesn't quite get human emotions and thinks you're stupid for not wanting to kill your family members. Now, before we really wrap up the Red Butler deep dive, we actually have one last chapter to look at. Another one of those breather, lighthearted chapters before we move into the next story arc. And as much as these chapters can feel like filler, we actually get a lot of insight into the characters, so I'm going to talk about it. We start off with Ciel having a nightmare, and in his sleepy haze, he pulls a gun on Sebastian, not fully aware of his surroundings, demanding not to be touched. Foreshadowing anyone? Honestly, people don't really consider foreshadowing for CL and his backstory until Book of Circus, but it's been here all along, plain as day. Well, the foreshadowing in the Red Butler arc is more so things that can be read into what's said and more foreshadowing on CL's feelings and hangups, but this chapter? Right out the gate with his PTSD symptoms. However, it's explained away by the fact that he was reading Edgar Allan Poe before bed, Sure. And it's also a big day, because Aunt Midford is coming to visit. Yes, the Red Butler arc and following chapter may as well just be called Getting to Know Ciel's Aunts, the story arc. Ciel panics, stating that they have to hurry up and get ready because it is Aunt Frances, implying that she's rather particular, which I get it. I have family members that are also rather particular, so when they come to visit, it is a big deal and everything needs to be spotless. In fact, Aunt Frances is so particular that she is greatly displeased with Ciel and Sebastian's appearances, stating that their bangs are far too long for males and fixing them up to be proper gentlemen. We learn that Aunt Frances is Vincent's sister, and she actually met her husband by beating him at a fencing tournament. He's, he's like the head knight or something like that. Aunt Frances is pretty powerful and she's a stickler for rules and order, and it's up to her to whip her nephew and his servants into shape. She can't have her daughter marrying a degenerate now, can she? <laughs> yes, if you missed it before, Ciel and Lizzie are first cousins. I don't know why they're engaged. It's a political thing, really and truly. Um, I also, I don't think they knew about the medical dangers of incest back then but it's still weird but you know what we can take solace in the fact that Ciel most likely will not be alive long enough to marry Lizzie and have children so that kid's dying young hate to say it and in typical early black butler humor as Sebastian gives Aunt Frances a tour of the manor 
he finds that the other three servants have somehow managed to screw everything up, causing Sebastian to lead everyone out to the stables to look at the new horses instead. Aunt Frances then gets the idea of going hunting as a way for Ciel to prove his worth as Lizzie's future husband, and to prove that he's not just a fragile little boy, which I'm not sure if we're supposed to read into this um, with the twin Ciel thing. We're not going to talk a whole lot about that, but basically the reason I think this might be important for that is the twins, you have, bear with me, you have real Ciel, who was the, the older, I mean, they're twins, so how much older can he really be? But the older twin who was healthier and set to inherit everything and become Vincent's successor. And then you have our CL, who was very sick. He, he took after Rachel. He had asthma. He was very fragile as a kid. So this almost seems like Ciel having to prove that he is who he says he is and not who he really is. If that's confusing, we'll talk about it later as the manga gets there. I just really, really needed to provide that context for my thoughts on this bit. Lizzie ends up having a moment with Sebastian where she mentions that Ciel seems to be feeling better. She really tries her best to cheer him up, but Lizzie tends to get too carried away and ends up getting on his nerves instead. I also think it's really funny that both Ciel and Francis seem to be competitive, and I love that they entertain each other on that front. I honestly read this whole hunting competition more as Francis doing something for Ciel and spending time with him instead of her actually having beef with him. She just wants what's best for Ciel and Lizzie. And it's pretty clear that Ciel has spent a great deal of time with his family throughout his life. Francis and Ciel come to a draw, and while discussing tiebreakers, a bear comes out to be a part of the party. Ciel immediately jumps to protect Lizzie, and Francis shoots the bear, breaking their tie, but also proving that Ciel is worthy of marrying Lizzie. I also think it's sweet that Francis acknowledges that Ciel is still quite young and has a lot of growing to do before he could really take her on in a competition. As they leave, Francis reveals to Sebastian that she knows he killed the bear with a knife. She admits that her shots missed since she was too worried about Lizzie. She questions why Sebastian let everyone believe that Francis took the bear down and beat Ciel, to which Sebastian more or less says Ciel needed to learn a lesson Ciel can't always win, and he really needed to be humbled. They get back home to find that the servants have prepared a birthday celebration for Ciel. It's his 13th birthday! Woo! Let's go! He stays 13 for a while. I'm pretty sure he is still 13 in the manga right now, which means that from this point, this, is, this chapter takes place at the very end of volume 3. So from the very end of volume three up until what are we at? Like chapter 200 is coming out, but I think we're on like volume 38 or 39 or something ridiculous like that. Not even a full year has passed. Not even a full year has passed since this chapter and the current chapter of the manga. From what I remember, don't, I was thinking about this when I woke up this morning because we have the Jack the Ripper arc, which takes place I'm assuming in September, kind of that era. This chapter obviously takes place in December. The next story arc, I think, takes place December, January-ish. Book of Circus takes place sometime in the winter. And after Book of Circus, you have Book of Murder. It's unclear the time frame, but I think that's early spring. Then after Book of Murder, you have the Book of Atlantic, which takes place, I think, late spring, early summer. Then you have the Western Arc, which I'm pretty sure takes place in June or July. It does specify a month. I just don't remember. Then after the Western Arc, you have the the Green Emerald Witch Arc, which I, th I feel like that takes place in August. I feel it in my gut. It takes place in August, but I have no clue. I don't know if- I don't remember if they specified. And then after that, you have the Blue Sect Arc, and the which takes place, I would assume, like August, September, that era. Then there's a special chapter that takes place in Halloween, somewhere in there. But I don't know if that falls into canon. 
And basically, we haven't reached December yet. So I'm pretty sure this whole everything, the whole manga from here on out is in the span of like a year. Not quite a year yet. I'm fascinating. The timeline, the timeline is zooming. <laughs> CL's going through so much so quickly all the time. Life needs to slow down for him and for everyone. <laughs> anyway, as they celebrate, Francis reveals that she knew of all the mishaps Sebastian was avoiding earlier that day, letting us know that she is much more aware than most people tend to be so far in the series. But obviously not aware enough to know that Sebastian is a demon. However, she does express distaste for his face. And I want to mention this because there are some fan theories on the nature of the Phantom Hive bloodline. There is a character who is later on revealed to be a reaper who people think could be Vincent and Francis's father. It's all fan theory right now. And Francis is portrayed as an amazingly powerful woman. We don't see her exhibit ability outside of human capabilities, but it is mentioned that she is surprisingly strong, so take that for what it's worth. We then get a moment of Sebastian not understanding humans, and honestly, this is pretty standard, generic, fish out of water, demon in the human realm type of thing. Not too much to say here, but we do end the chapter on an introduction to two new faces. However, We'll have to wait until the next video to discuss these two. And that has been my deep dive into the Red Butler arc. Thank you so much for watching. I hope these make sense. I write the scripts as I read through the arcs. And I'm going to be honest, I don't proofread anything. I just kind of write it all down. And I'm like, yep, this is perfect. This is great. And then I record the video. So thank you so much for watching. I hope these are making sense. I hope you guys are enjoying. I'm kind of doing a combination of analysis and summary because I like to watch video essays that kind of summarize things so I can essentially reread or rewatch something without actually rereading and rewatching something. So that's what I'm kind of going for. But then I also want to talk about my thoughts and feelings because I have a lot to say. I never shut up. That's why these videos are so long. I'm sorry. <laughs> This is the end. I will see you all in the next video where we move on to, it's officially called the Indian Butler arc, but we're gonna talk about Prince Soma and Agni in the next video, so I hope you guys are hype. Anyway, bye.